storing board games can be quite a hassle in a bookshelf they are problematic as it's always the one on the bottom of the shelf that you want so having an individual shelf per board game is really quite handy the problem is there's no standardized sizing so having that many shelves can be tricky to find i've been inspired by box thrones modular board game storage system but this is a little bit ugly being all steel construction so i've made this which i'm dubbing the box usurper it features adjustable shelving via a sawtooth mechanism ah and these shelves are quite strong it can even store problematic cats on them so i've got my drawing for the design for the cabinet and with the timber i've got i've started marking out roughly where all the pieces are going to fall uh, it's a little hard to see on camera i've used both a pencil and a pen i'm going to start by breaking down this long board into shorter sections that are easier to joint uh, and then i will probably rip a lot of it at the bandsaw to get it into a rough size and then it's going to be more manageable on all the other tools to actually get to the final dimensions With the stock jointed, I could move on to ripping to rough width. Without a dedicated rip blade for my table saw, which arrived part way through this build, going to the bandsaw was actually the better option. With just a single cut to rip, rather than having to do multiple passes, let alone all the burning and resistance found at the table saw, the bandsaw processed it very quickly. Either way, both the table saw and bandsaw ripped pieces had their sizes finalised at the thickness of. For the two back panels and the two side panels of the cabinet, these guys here and here, we've got a few options. First off, I could get a board, resaw it down to um, about 12 mil, glue it up, make up a panel that way. It probably involves the most amount of cost, both time and money. Another option is I could definitely go thinner than that. I could go down to veneer sizes and then glue that onto some sort of substrate, MDF, plywood, whatever. The downside with that is I don't have a thickness sander or a drum sander, so getting a decent consistent finish on those veneers would be a little bit difficult. That method is the most expensive in time, but in terms of money it's not so bad because one board will be able to resell quite a lot actually. Another option is just to buy the veneer and then go from there. That saves time, but again you've got that money factor. What I'm going to go for is this plantation oak veneered MDF. So this is pre-veneered. This works out quite inexpensive. All I have to do is cut it to size and then I'm done. I don't need to do any gluing. Now when people hear MDF often they think of all the negative properties like it's not all that structural or it's prone to warpage if it gets wet. Neither of those are issues in this case. The panels are simply decorative panels. They don't need to be there at all but they'll look nicer with panels in. And because of that, all the MDF is going to be nice and sealed away. So the benefits of MDF are it's dead flat and it's dimensionally stable, more so than plywood. This is less than half the price of having the same veneer, but on a high grade plywood like birch plywood. So really for this use, this is the best of all situations. For the short rails and the longer to back rails, I'll be putting the MDF panels in. So I need to cut a groove in that to accept the panels. So I've got a test piece here. I'm going to do this at the router table and then with the plunge router when I move to the legs. Uh, I'm just a bit more comfortable doing it this way than using a dado stick for this particular task. The MDF comes in at slightly more than half an inch. So this is sold as 12 millimeter, but it's actually 12.75 millimeter. Half inch is 12.7 millimeter. 
Not a huge difference, but it does mean that when I'm using a half inch spiral upcut bit, I'm going to need to do two passes to actually create a groove. So I've got a sample piece here, it's the same width, it's just a lot shorter than the small rails. I've roughly centered my stock uh, in relation to the router table and I'm going to do a couple of passes. I've actually offset it very slightly so that way to get my extra width all I have to do is rotate the workpiece around, make another pass and it should be not only centered but just wide enough to accept the MDF panels. I want a snug fit. I don't want to have to hammer it in but I do want a snug fit which is why I need two passes. So I'm going to sneak up on the best fit possible. I'm going to be using dominoes, loose tendons to do the joinery for this uh, because it's fast and accurate. If you want to use more accessible tools to build the same thing, you can definitely go with dowels. I'm not going to cover that in this video and in my previous video, furniture build video on the outdoor table, there'll be a link somewhere. I did integral mortise and tenon using a table saw and a plunge router. So you can certainly use that. It's just not as fast. For the rails and essentially the two front dividers or styles, I've already milled all the mortises. Very uneventful, very biscuit jointer like in that. For the legs, I need to do a little bit more layout to make it a little bit more decorative. And that's why I have yet to put in the grooves for the plywood, for the MDF panels. On the legs, I've set my domino to five millimeters more than what I did for the horizontal rails. Mortises for the horizontal rails were dead in the center. For the legs, I want it not on the very edge, I wanted to offset just a little bit. So I've added five millimeters to the depth setting or height setting on the domino to create a five millimeter reveal, which is the same as the reveal that the, the MDF panels have on the rails. So I've quickly dry fit the whole thing together to make sure that there's no obvious flaws and I found one. I cut these support rails far too short because I didn't account for the thickness of the legs and to offset that. So that's no problem, I've got some spare stock. But the other reason for doing the dry fit is so I can mark out where the grooves for the panels for the legs will go. Grooves in the legs aren't through grooves, they're stopped grooves. So they can't really be done with the dado stack on the table saw because I'd have to drop it on go to a certain point then lift it off, very dangerous. Less dangerous on the router table, but it's still not my most favorite activity to do. So I'll be switching to a plunge router to cut those grooves. So I've marked out where they are to go. So now I can set my edge guide on my plunge router and cut those grooves pretty much the same way as I did for the short rails. With the grooves cut, the panels can be then trimmed to final size. Since it's such a thin veneer, uh, on these, maybe, I don't know, a millimetre at most. We need to be careful so we don't sand through and reveal the MDF underneath. Because they're already at probably the equivalent of 120, I've got a 240, sorry, 220 grit pad on my sander. I've also got the sander turned down to fourth speed out of six, and the dust extraction turned down as well, otherwise it'll really suck everything down. I'm only going to use the one grit, and I've drawn on this uh, just with a pencil pattern going back and forth very lightly with a HB pencil so that I can see where I've been and where I need to go. I'm starting with the B side. If the B side isn't as good that's going to be on the inside of the cabinet. You'll be able to see it but it'll be much more difficult to see so that I get a feel for how the veneer holds up under sandpaper pressure. I'm using these Abernet discs from Merca. They are really quite nice discs. I've got quite a few boxes of them, but Abronet can be a little bit aggressive, even at the finer grits. Uh, so it's good because it removes a lot of material quickly, but in this case, we need to be quite delicate with it. To be efficient with the finishing before glue up, other tasks like epoxy filling the rails, rounding over and sanding the frame parts were all done.
I'm using Osmos PolyX on everything. On any of the joinery surfaces, like the mortises, I've taped off so the finish won't interfere with the glue. The two end assemblies are glued up separate from the rest of the frame. Before the final cabinet is glued together, we need to think about how the top's being attached. Now you can't just screw the top down, or up as the case is, or use other permanent types of attachment like glue because of wood movement. It's a solid wood top, so the wood, the top will expand and contract along its width. And if that is restricted, it will pull itself apart. There are lots of ways that we could do this. Uh, figure eight clips are quite popular. There are homemade buttons, I think people call them, that do a similar job. I like to use the commercial version of that, which is this little Z clip. They're quite inexpensive and they're quick, basically. I have covered this before, but it bears repeating. One half of this clip sits in a groove, then it's screwed up into the top. Because it's in a groove, it can slide up and down that groove, but it still holds the top nice and tight. And that way, if there's any expansion, it can either swivel or slide in the groove. There are three ways I can think of to make the grooves for these clips. The easiest way is using a biscuit jointer. The cutter is about the right size. I think it's five millimeters you need. Might be four millimeters and you plunge in and you're done. But as I don't have a biscuit jointer, the easiest way for me is the domino. It's gonna be used exactly like a biscuit jointer, so don't panic from that point of view. You set the height on either the biscuit jointer or your domino to 10 to 12 millimeters uh, on the fence and use a five millimeter or slightly larger, I wouldn't go more than the six millimeter cutter and set it on the wider, either the medium or widest setting on the domino. Biscuit jointer slots will be just fine. Uh, you probably want to cut a number tw 10 or 20, might be a 20 on the biscuit jointer. The third way, which is much more accessible is using a plunge router. You can either use a slot cutter bit they're a bit more specialty, so you may not have that, or you can just use a straight bit. Quarter inch cutter would be the largest you'd want to use, so a five, six millimeter would be better, but a quarter inch will do just fine. Just cut a straight groove, that's all the domino is doing. It's a little bit wider than the clip to allow forward movement. It's important to do this ahead of the final glue up, otherwise you might run into a situation where you actually can't get whatever tool it is you're using into the cabinet to actually cut the grooves. Speaking of the top, the stock I had was too thick at 45mm, so I quickly reduced that to 25mm by resawing and thicknessing. Then I could glue up using pipe clamps and hardwood cogs with packing tape on so they didn't stick. Final dimensioning to width and length was left until after the glue dried using the track saw and my new ripping blade. This is the top side of the top of the cabinet. On this side I'm going to do just a gentle round over. It's going to be a two millimeter radius round over bit that I've used elsewhere. It's really good for breaking an edge consistently without rounding over visually. That'll happen on all four sides. On the underside, I'm going to put a gentle chamfer. I have an uh, oversized chamfering bit, but it'll do the job. I just don't need to put it all the way down. This is an example of why I like a tail vise and a row of bench dogs on a workbench for hybrid woodworking, I suppose. I've got this very securely clamped and I can route away, but the clamps aren't in the way of these uh, relatively small bearing guided bits. The shelf standards, that is the saw teeth mechanism that runs vertically, is using a 22.5 degree angle, which means it isn't possible to cut on the table saw. As such, a lot more of the layout needs to be done, spacing everything 40 millimeters apart. The angle is then scribed on using a bevel gauge. After ganging all the standards together with tape, the straight cut is made using the crosscut slate of the table saw. This is just lined up by eye using the zero clearance plate. 
The angles can be fairly easily cut at the bandsaw, but it does require a reasonable amount of cleanup. A quick way using the same angle may have been to use a handsaw to do it all. The corresponding cleat pieces are cut very easily and quickly using a miter gauge. A fit doesn't have to be too exact. A loose fit won't actually fall down, but a too tight fit will bind. The standards won't actually get glued onto the cabinet. Instead, they'll just be aligned using a loose 4mm domino. A biscuit or dowel would work fine too. At this point, the final glue up could occur. With 16 dominoes or so, it can be difficult to have the time to get everything aligned, especially as PVA swells the joints and makes them harder to insert. I went with epoxy as it lubricates the joint and provides more working time. Liquid hide glue would have actually been a little bit easier to work with here, but I used what I had on hand. Strength-wise, PVA, epoxy or hide glue really don't matter. I realised that the central plates could be easily knocked down, so a space a piece to fit between the central standards was cut, and thickness down for a snug fit. If you make this, you could consider making a single piece all laminated up. A late design change was to add a solid floor or bottom shelf to the cabinet. Because this is going in after the glue up, it needed to be two halves to fit in, and a notch to fit around the legs of the cabinet. To attach these floor pieces, for lack of a better term, uh, they are a pretty good fit friction wise we can get that in at all. But to keep it from falling down, I'm going to create a few cleats. Just going to use whatever scrap I've got on hand, cut to about 100 mil, place four on each of the two halves. Then I'll drill a oversized hole for a screw and they'll get screwed in directly. By oversizing the hole, I've got a little bit of wriggle room up and down to get this perfectly flush with the top of this rail here. The one thing to note with that is I'm going to be using a washer head screw or it's commonly known as a pocket head screw uh, rather than a countersink screw, a counter or a flat head screw. A countersunk screw will pull to a particular spot in the countersink and will defeat the purpose of oversizing the hole in the first place. To actually hold the board games up, rather than going with a solid shelf, I've opted to go with slats two per shelf. This consumes less material, making it lighter and cheaper while providing more than ample support for the board game boxes. To match the slats, the angled cleats need to be notched out to lock them in place, so they don't slide back and forth too much. These notches don't have to be particularly snug, a little bit of movement won't really affect the shelves. And finally, the top could be attached using the Z-clips. In case it's not clear, the shelves are made up of four parts. We've got the cleat that goes towards the middle section, that slots in, one that goes to the outside, and these two shelf parts that just span the distance between the two. These just drop together helps if we get them on the same level. The notches in the cleats stop the shelf parts from moving all that far. The notches in the standards stop the cleats from falling down. The spaces in the cleats or the panels stop it from falling out. That way we can adjust it for whatever height we like. And the reason why this isn't all glued together or isn't big solid shelves is honestly, we, we my wife and I, don't know what we want out of shelves for board game storage, so this gives us a lot of flexibility. We might want shelves that are a little bit taller so we can make a taller cleat, or perhaps a solid shelf for displaying figurines or, or whatever. At this stage, as I said, we don't really know, so by not gluing anything in, by having everything adjustable, we can make quite a flexible system that suits our needs as our board games and various things change. Thanks for watching.